In my second MathsCast on the vector product, I established the results for the vector products between the unit basis vectors i, j and k. I've written them out here again because we'll need to refer to them. In this MathsCast, I'm going to work out a formula for the vector product of any two vectors a and b in terms of the components of a and b. So we'd better start by writing down an a and b and write down the component form. They'd look like this. Now I'm going to write down a cross b using these component versions. Like this. To progress further I need to make an assumption which I'm not going to prove but I think it's quite plausible. I'm going to assume that the vector product is just like the scalar product, distributive. That's a fancy way of saying that you can expand brackets in the usual way. However, there's one thing we must be careful of. In expanding the brackets, we must preserve the order of the vectors. i cross j is different to j cross i. Let's start with a1i and distribute it over the b bracket. That's going to give us three terms. I've colour-coded the terms for reasons that will become apparent in a little while. I've also taken the liberty of moving the constants a1, b1 and b2 and so on all to the left so that the vectors are in direct contact with each other through the cross product. Let's now use the second part of a, that's a2j, and distribute that over the three b components. There are the three terms. And then finally the a3k crossed with all the B components. There, that's all nine terms, so the expansion is now finished. It looks a bit messy, doesn't it? But there is at least one minor simplification that we can do immediately. Remember that whenever you cross a vector with itself, the answer is the zero vector. That means that we can eliminate the three black terms with i cross i, j cross j, and k cross k. I'm going to cross them out now. OK, so that's reduced us from 9 to 6 terms. Now look at the pairings with colour. Look at the two blue ones, for example. The two blue terms are terms of the type 1, 2, and they both, both involve i and j. But now remember, j cross i is the same as negative i cross j. So actually, we could collect those two terms together with i cross j as an overall factor, so long as we compensate with a minus sign on the a2b1. Something like this. You can see where that minus sign has come from. It's because a2b1 was originally the coefficient of j cross i. I've changed j cross i to i cross j, but that of course includes an extra minus because of the nature of the cross product. If that works for the blue terms, it's going to work the same way for the green and red as well. So let's write all of those out now. Now that's definitely an improvement, isn't it? It's much more compact. But we can go a step further. Recall that i cross j, i cross k, and j cross k have the forms that we listed at the top of this presentation. Let's just quickly flick back there and look at them. There, you see, i cross j is k k cross j is negative i, k cross i is j, and so on. We can substitute those results into our vector product below. Let's go back there and do that now. There's the blue one, i cross j is the same as k. And then for the green one, i cross k is actually negative j. And the red one works similarly, j cross k is i. I've deliberately left the green negative sign at the front. There's a good reason for that. We'll talk about it in a moment. The form you see here is actually the correct component form for the vector product. Some people go as far as to remember it this way. Other people don't actually remember the formula, but they remember rules for creating the formula. One very good rule for creating this formula is to recognise the structures in the brackets. 
they are actually what you get when you expand a 2x2 two two determinant. If you don't know what a 2x2 two two determinant is, it doesn't really matter. I think it should be clear by looking at what, what I do now. A 2x2 two two determinant is just a function of four numbers that uses them to generate a single number using a particular rule. We write the determinant as a square array with bars each side. Something like this. I've used Greek letters alpha, beta, gamma, delta. The rule for evaluating the determinant is to multiply the terms on the diagonal, that's alpha, delta, and subtract the product of the terms on the off diagonal, that's beta, gamma. Can you see that that difference of products is exactly the kind of structure we've got in front of our i, j and k above? We could now write our vector product using this 2 by 2 determinant structure. Let me just scroll up so we can see the vector product again. There it is. I'll use the same colours so that you can see where each part of the new expression comes from. It looks like this. It's still not particularly friendly looking, is it? It turns out, though, that we can go a step further than we have. The structure we're seeing here happens to be precisely the definition of a 3x3 three three determinant. A 3x3 three three determinant has three rows and three columns. In the case of the structure I'm looking at here, the i, j and k should go across the top row, and the components of a and the components of b in the second and third rows respectively, in the correct order for the components, 1, 2, 3. So we get the following expression. That's much more compact, isn't it? And more memorable. Now as it happens, 3x3 three three determinants occur all over applied mathematics, not just in the case of the vector product, but in many applications in engineering and science. There is a rule for evaluating them, and you can see that rule in operation by looking at the line above where we've got the 2x2 two two determinants and the i, j and k outside. Because 3x3 three three determinants appear so often, people very quickly memorize how to evaluate them. Incidentally, I did mention before that I'd talk about that minus sign that I left there, didn't I? Well, the minus sign on the green term is essential in the definition of the 3x3 three three determinant, and that's why I left it there explicitly. Well, at this point, I can hear you say, that's all very well, but I still need to somehow to remember the structure for breaking down the 3x3 three three determinant into 2x2 two two parts and then evaluating it further. I think you'll see that if we do an example, this will become quite obvious. So now I'm going to introduce an a and b with in component form and evaluate their vector product, a cross b. I've chosen this pair of vectors. Let's start to form the vector product using a 3x3 three three determinant. So comparing to the black determinant at the top of the page now, I've got to put i, j and k across the top row. That's easy enough. Now the components of a have got to go in the second row. The components are 2, 3 and negative 1. And then the components of b, 1, negative 4, 5, go along the bottom row. So there's our compact form as a determinant. All we have to do now is remember the process that formed that determinant in reverse. In other words, we need to evaluate the determinant. The process is as follows. We do what's called expanding across the top row. What that means is that we take the elements in the top row, i, j and k, and write them down with a bit of space each side to allow for some coefficients. It's also the rule that we must alternate the sign, starting with plus. So plus i, minus j, and plus k. Let's do that now. I've allowed plenty of space because the coefficients are going to be 2 by 2 determinants. For the coefficient of i, we imagine crossing out the row and the column containing i. That will leave a block of four numbers. We use the 2 by 2 determinant of that block, like this. After doing the crossing out, I'm left with 3, negative 1, negative 4, 5. I make a 2x2 two two determinant from those numbers in the same order. 
Now let's get rid of that crossing out and for the J term I cross out the row and column containing the J instead. That leaves me a different block of numbers 2, negative 1, 1, 5. And then I do the same procedure for the K. After a bit of practice you can do this by eye without crossing things out at all. The block now is 2, 3, 1, negative 4. Now that doesn't look particularly nice yet, but we must remember that these 2x2 two two determinants can be evaluated by multiplying the numbers down the diagonal and subtracting the product of the numbers on the off diagonal. So let's do that next. Here's what we get. If you want to check it, just pause the video for a moment and check that I've done that right. The final step is to actually evaluate the terms in brackets. I'm going to do that in one go because it's just simple arithmetic. As it turns out, the coefficients all come to plus or minus 11. That was just a fluke. There's nothing special about 11 here. I didn't plan it that way either. So I claim that this is the answer to the cross product of my A crossed with my B. Now remember, a cross product of two vectors should be perpendicular to both the original vectors. When vectors are perpendicular to each other, that means their dot product is zero. So it should be the case that A cross B dotted with A or with B should both give zero. I'm going to use that as a check to convince you that what I've done here has come out right. So I'm going to look at A cross B dot A and A cross B dot B. So this is the check. Let's go back and look at what A and B were. Let's begin with A. A was the vector with components 2, 3, negative 1. So in shorthand form, the dot product will look like this. Let's evaluate it. We want 11 times 2, that's 22, minus 11 times 3, and then negative 11 times, neg times negative 1 is plus 11. And sure enough, that does come to zero. OK, that's promising. Now let's check the other one. A cross B dotted with B is 11, negative 11, negative 11 dotted with. We quickly go back and check what B was. It was 1, negative 4, 5. And doing the dot product gives us 1 times 11 minus 4 11s. Sorry, that's minus 4 times minus 11, so it's plus 44. And then minus 11 times 5 is 55. And sure enough, that again comes to 0. So our A cross B is indeed perpendicular to both A and B. And I think that should be convincing that we've almost certainly got the right way of evaluating A cross B. I'm going to call it a day there.